right, it is uh, five minutes past the scheduled start time and really appreciate you guys joining and, and waiting the, the, for these extra moments for the rest of the folks to join in as they dial into the webinar. Um, my name is Jabez Tan. I am the head of research at Structure Research. Welcome to a, a Structure Research webinar in partnership with PLDT. Uh, I think you guys are going to have a really informative session today to learn not just about uh, the kind of research that we're doing on the Philippines market, but also hearing from PLDT themselves on what's happening on the ground from a hyperscale standpoint uh, in the Philippines market as well. And so uh, this will be the agenda moving forward. There, there's going to be three main parts. So the first part will be myself giving a short presentation on the Philippines uh, data center market and the outlook for the Philippines over the next five years, uh, followed by um, there'll be two representatives from PLDT Enterprise, Gary and Emil. Uh, they'll have short presentations as well, and then we'll do uh, a really quick fireside, fireside chat sessions with both of them to um, get a feel for what, what PLDT is doing to address hyperscale requirements and demand in the Philippines market. And then at the very end, we'll have a general Q&A session to answer any of the audience's uh, questions on either my presentation or Gary or, or, or Emil's presentations as well. So uh, do keep your questions till the end. We, we love to answer them at the very end. Um, so without further ado, um, let's just kick off the webinar straight away. Um, you know, wanted to level set everyone with the taxonomy that we're presenting as part of our data center co-location market research study so that we're all on the same page here in terms of terminology, how we're defining the space, um, and so wanted to start with the very left-hand column where we have retail co-location, which is um, smaller data center co-location deployments, typically um, you know, under 240 kW of capacity. Uh, and these are typically in shared environments, um, and, and these are typically you know, between one to three years in terms of contract lengths. Um, but I think the, the most exciting part of the ecosystem right now has obviously centered around the hyperscale segment. And there's two you know, sub-segments between uh, underneath that hyperscale co-location segment, and that's uh, what we call enterprise wholesale as well as hyperscale. Uh, and so as you can see, enterprise wholesale, sort of that in between between retail and hyperscale where you have uh, deployments anywhere between 240 to 2 megawatt, 240 kW to 2, 2 megawatts of capacity. Uh, and these are typically you know, anywhere from financial services, banks, <coughs> manufac manufacturing companies, logistics, uh, even government organizations. And then on the far right, you have uh, hyperscale deals that typically range from two megawatts all the way to uh, over 100 megawatts, especially in the more mature tier one markets uh, globally. And so these typically will come from uh, the public cloud providers like AWS and Microsoft, Google, Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei. Uh, and so that that those deployments will fall within the hyperscale bucket right here, as you can see. Um, but one of to dive a little bit deeper because you know hyperscale is a very broad umbrella and we wanted to create uh, and, and share a little bit more nuance in terms of how we're splitting this hyperscale bucket. Uh, and so we came up with a, a two terms, core hyperscale and edge hyperscale to, to flesh out and give you a better sense of what is actually happening with these hyperscale deployments, not just in tier two markets or emerging markets, but also in, on a tier one level. And so let's start with the core hyperscale segment, which is the, the primary, um, segment that has you know been front and center in a lot of news and press releases and developments uh, in the data center sector. And so on the far left, you have the more traditional uh, co-location deployments where hyperscalers like AWS, Microsoft, Google will lease capacity from a data center operator or third party uh, data center service provider. Uh, and these will typically be in multi-tenant facilities where you have multiple customers in there. Um, sometimes they'll lease a, a data dedicated hall or cage or suite. Um, and then on the far right hand side, you have uh, the self built section, which is hyperscalers um, deciding to build their own data centers for their own use. So not leasing from third party operators, but doing it themselves. And these can range from, you know, these these tend to be big, big bills. So, so starting off at, at 50 megawatts typically, and then it can get to, um, you know, 100, 200 megawatt campuses moving forward, although we do expect the sizes to get bigger and bigger, especially with what we're tracking here in the U.S. market. And then in the middle, which, which is what we call built to suit, and this is becoming an increasing focus and, 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 a, and a sweet spot for the hyperscale market because um, the, the hyperscale value chain is maturing to the point where, uh, especially the tier one hyperscalers like Microsoft, Google, and Amazon, they're starting to be able to take down 
large chunks of capacity at a given time or at a given lease. So uh, between 20 to 50 megawatts at a given time is, is pretty normal for them to take down in very mature tier one markets. And so that's why we're seeing more of a dynamic from built to suits, uh, as well as the influx of real estate developers and, and traditional real estate firms and investors coming into the space uh, in order to play a part in the data center industry. And so this is a extremely dynamic um, segment that has you know these three main buckets in it. And then a really nascent but emerging and also a very interesting segment that we're tracking is what we call edge hyperscale. And I think a lot of people in the data center industry, if, you're, if you've been around for a long time, you're very familiar with the network on ramp section. And that typically will be you know, small uh, deployments from the hyperscalers within, you know, people will call it carrier hotels, which is very densely interconnected data centers where they'll deploy these on ramps in order to tether that into a larger compute node or larger cloud region that they will direct their customers towards. And so what we're seeing now today is um, the maturation of their edge strategy. So moving from network on ramps into edge nodes, and these are, for example, AWS has local zones that are deploying across tier two markets in Asia. And these tend to be you know, typically between 500 kW to two megawatts of capacity. Uh, although we do expect these edge nodes to, to scale over time. And so it's, it's a hyperscaler's way of, of entering these markets, uh, having local footprints, and then incrementally scale that as adoption and demand accelerates. And then what we're seeing on the far right, which is very nascent as well, what we call proximate compute nodes. And these are um, larger edge nodes, but then also um, you know, reaching the size of, 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 you know, smaller cloud regions. And this is a very nascent development that we're seeing play out in the U.S. market currently and, and certain select scenarios in, in Europe. Uh, but we do expect this to eventually make its way to the APAC region, um, albeit adapting to the, the specific nuances of each of these markets. And then before we dive into the numbers around the, the capacity of the Philippines, where it's headed, I uh, wanted to give you a sense of how we're defining this data center capacity, how we're defining the supply that we're tracking in the Philippines. And so there's two main tiers. You have uh, what we call currently built out capacity, which is capacity that's fitted out and live. Oftentimes there's already live customers deployed in there. Um, and this is what's built out in, in the data center space. Um, and, and we're only tracking data center capacity that's deployable for server racks. We don't count you know, lobby areas or M&E equipment areas. It's just purely uh, the rackable square footage or the rackable critical IT load capacity. Uh, and then we take it one step further to look at max built out capacity. So what would the market supply look like if all the existing data centers would have fully built out their existing, um, the rest of the capacity for the site? And so that I think captures a, a good tier of, of what the potential is for, for the market currently. And then we take it one more step further in terms of looking at total capacity. So that's everything that max built out capacity is, but then we uh, incorporate uh, sites under development as well as land banking to get a really full total bird's eye view picture of exactly what the supply landscape will look like uh, today and, and, and in the next five years. And so with that, um, you know, wanted to show you this chart right here on the Philippines data center co-location market size. So where we are today, you know, by the end of 2020, we're expecting that the currently built out capacity in the Philippines will be around 57 megawatts. And that's largely concentrated in the Manila metro area. And then because of the, the, um, the recent announcements uh, by international and local operators entering and building new sites in the Philippines. That's why you see that big jump in total capacity uh, between 2021 and 2022. Just a lot of announcements coming in from the data center development side as a, a lot of operators are seeing the opportunity and the bullish outlook for the Philippines market as it relates to hyperscale infrastructure deployments moving forward. And so what you're seeing here is the the data center clusters or the way data centers have been distributed today in the Philippines. Um, as you can see, most of the data centers today in Manila are located in central Manila. So in Pasig, Makati area um, are, are some of where the, the most densely interconnected data centers are. And we'll, we'll show you a, a list of the care hotels in central Manila later on in the presentation. Um, but as you can see, you're not too many data centers in the north and also not too many in the south. And there's currently six data centers under development today. Um, but what's interesting is that most of the data centers that are being built today or under development today are located towards the south of Manila. So in that Santa Rosa, Binyan, uh, Batangas area, uh, and the Laguna area. And so that's where we think a lot of the hyperscale activity is going to center around is the south of Manila as well as the central part of Manila uh, once these new sites come online. 
And just to give you a sense for who is building in the, the Manila market, you have, you know, um, local operators like PLDT, Dito, B Infotech, as well as international um, and regional operators like Digital Edge, Space DC, uh, Cloud Centers, Flow Digital, that have all announced builds in the in the Manila market. So as you can see here, most of it is centered around South Manila as well as Central Manila, and that's collectively going to inject 230 megawatts plus of a critical IT load capacity once all these sites are fully built out. And that's why you see that big jump in the total capacity number that we're projecting for the Philippines market moving forward. And just to take a step back as to why I think a lot of the operators and a lot of people are betting on the Philippines market. Just look at it, looking at it from a population standpoint for the Southeast Asia region, you can see here that most of the uh, population in Southeast Asia is centered around Indonesia and the Philippines. So Indonesia being the most populous country in, in ASEAN and then followed by Philippines at 110 million. And so that's why I think people are, are seeing that differential, that gap between data center capacity installed today in some of these very densely populated countries uh, and where it can be moving forward, what's the potential for that moving forward. And so just under 600 million people in the Southeast Asia region, and that presents a really um, high addressable market for not just US, but also Chinese hyperscale cloud players to expand and deploy their services in, in the ASEAN region. But looking at it from a data center capacity standpoint, you can quickly see that there's a big differential, right? That the population doesn't necessarily map onto data center capacity today. Uh, and as you can see here, Singapore roughly accounting for 65% of the data center um, capacity in ASEAN today, followed by Indonesia at 14%, and then Philippines, uh, sorry, and Malaysia at 8%. Uh, but you know, we do think that this shows how the dynamic is shifting. Um, and so what we want to articulate here is that Singapore has naturally been the hub for hyperscalers to serve all of Southeast Asia. They deployed and centralized their footprints initially in markets like Singapore, Hong Kong, Sydney, uh, and Tokyo in order to get economies of scale, in order to create that hub effect. Uh, but I think as the, their cloud platforms mature, as use, end user requirements become more and more complex, as low, lower latency becomes more of a factor, data sovereignty and data privacy regulations become more front and center. That's driving a lot of the hyperscalers to think about deploying localized footprints in all of these countries in ASEAN and so Philippines. Um, definitely an attractive location, not just because of the population density, but also because of where it's situated in relation to Southeast Asia and connecting that to the rest of East and North Asia as well. So as you can see, 836 megawatts in ASEAN today. Um, with Philippines still representing a very small slice of that overall pie, although we do expect that to accelerate and the Philippines to gain more and more market share moving forward. And looking at it from a different way, which is you know, the way we look at it is um, from a qualitative standpoint, we publish a market maturity index that gives a five-year outlook on the markets in the Asia Pacific region. As you can see here, there's on the top right, you have the mature T1 markets that everyone's familiar with. And then what we have here is we've included this area called the opportunity quadrant, which is which is we think is a sweet spot between looking at markets that are right on the cusp of accelerating and 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 growing to the to a certain a meaningful level of scale. And so you can see here Manila being right in the center center there, just behind Jakarta in terms of growth and upside on the y-axis. And we do expect that uh, that Manila will be very attractively positioned relative to the other markets in ASEAN. As you can see, uh, there's going to be a lot of activity or has been a lot of activity in other markets throughout Southeast Asia, like Jakarta, uh, KL, Johor, Bangkok, and even Hanoi in, in the Vietnam market recently. And then with, especially with the moratorium um, or the limiting of capacity in Singapore uh, due to the partial lifting of the moratorium, we do think that will drive a lot more data center development activity across not just Manila, but all the other tier two Southeast Asia markets. And then looking, you know, higher level, right? So looking at what we call the flat market, flat and jash market. So flat being an acronym that people use to um, characterize the top four markets in Europe. So Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam, Paris, and then jash being the acronym for Asia to capture Japan, Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong, and, and looking at where the flat markets are right now, as well in relation to the JASH markets, as you can see here, you know, really, really large tier one markets um, with Tokyo and London leading the way. And then at the tail end, you have Singapore, Hong Kong, Paris, um, 
in, in the back end. But then, you know, looking at the non jash markets in Asia uh, and highlighting these markets, I think is very important because this is where a lot of the opportunity, a lot of the upside is coming to play, given how saturated, how competitive a lot of these tier one markets are. As you can see here, Manila is projected to become the second largest uh, emerging market in Southeast Asia by 2026, uh, just behind Jakarta from, from a Southeast Asia perspective. But then if you look at Asia as a whole, you can see here we're very bullish or we're tracking a lot of supply coming in from you know markets like Seoul, Osaka, Mumbai, Melbourne as well. And so I think those markets will will show outsized growth, but from a you know the second tier set of markets, we we think Philippines is very attractively positioned um, as as a hyperscale hub moving forward. And this chart here today, I think, really illustrates how nascent we are in the overall hyperscale cloud infrastructure rollout. Um, there's a lot of red X's in there on here, which sort of says, hey, the cloud guys have not fully ramped up their infrastructure deployments in, in the Philippines just yet. You see here, mostly it's taken the form of edge nodes or CDN nodes or caching nodes uh, with you know, AWS, Microsoft, Tencent, Huawei deploying these edge deployments in Manila so far. You have Alibaba Cloud being the first you know, public cloud platform to formally deploy a cloud region um, as of late last year. Um, but then I think you know, as you move forward, you, you'll start to see more and more deployments or, or cloud regions being announced over the next three to five years. As you can see, AWS is already you know, starting its entry into the market with the announcement of a local zone. Uh, Microsoft recently hired a, a, a country manager um, for the Philippines. And so I think these are initial indicators for us that, that that lead us to think that there's more and more coming for the hyperscalers, and it's just a matter of when and not if um, the hyperscale rollout will happen in the, in the Philippines market. And so as you can see here, we're still at the very nascent stages in terms of hyperscale capacity deployments. We're only at you know, five or five-ish megawatts a day in terms of hyperscale capacity being deployed in the Philippines. And we do expect that to 25X to 126 megawatts by 2026. So a, a more distributed fashion, more hyperscalers coming in. Um, and I, we do think that this is a relatively uh, conservative projection. Uh, and, we, and we project these numbers based on what we're seeing happen across uh, comparable tier two markets that are slightly further ahead of the curve than Manila or Philippines and also where tier one markets are today in terms of how hyperscalers have ramped up these cloud region deployments over time. And so, you know, really benchmarking not just APAC markets, but global markets to where we think the hyperscale capacity could be in the Philippines, Philippines today, I think triangulates to this 126 megawatt number that we're showing you today. And then looking at the top three most interconnected data centers in the Philippines, you have two of them being from PLDT and then one coming from Globe Telecom. As you can see, most of the the interconnected sites are, are in the central Manila area, given that's where all the networks are congregating. And so you have um, various IXs, both local, and then you have you know international SDN platforms like Zenlayer, uh, Unitas also being present in the Philippines as well. And so I think that's going to be a, a really important um, value proposition moving forward is to be able to tether these carry hotels or in the future, these are, are likely going to be cloud hotels into these cloud regions that are going to be further out, whether it be in South Manila or, or the northern part of Manila. Just to, just to recap, before I hand it over to our, our next presenter, um, some of the key themes in the Philippines market that we think it's, a, it's, it's ripe and a prime destination for uh, the decentralized architecture of the hyperscalers to land in, in a market like the Philippines. There's also really strong government support um, for digital infrastructure growth that I think my, uh, my, my friends Gary and Emil will articulate later on. Um, the Chinese platforms are slightly ahead of the US hyperscalers in terms of cloud infrastructure rollout, but we do think that uh, the US guys will, will eventually catch up and even uh, surpass the Chinese hyperscalers in terms of size and deployments. Um, and I think Singapore limiting the capacity for data center development in country will ultimately be a, a, a bullish development and, and will benefit markets like the Philippines moving forward. And so this is my email address um, if you want to reach out for feedback or comments. Um, and then again, we'll have a general q and if you have any questions on what I just presented um, here. But I'll just stop there. And I wanted to introduce um, uh, our, our first representative from PLDT Enterprise. His name is Gary Ignacio, who is the VP and head of strategic business development at PLDT Enterprise. Uh, Gary will do a short presentation followed by uh, myself and Gary will have a chat and we'll do a, a fireside Q&A with, with Gary. And so let me hand the mic or, or the, the, the session over to Gary. Uh, thank you, Zavdes, and uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everybody can hear me well. 
Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to be here. Um, essentially, I'd like to tackle and share to our dear audience the unique proposition of the Philippines as an emerging hyperscale and cloud region destination. And I'd like to begin with the country's macroeconomic standing. So the Philippines has exhibited strong growth and great resilience as we exited the height of the pandemic. Overall GDP growth in 2021 stood at 5.6%, that actually exceeded Southeast Asian region expectation of 1% to 4%. And if it was any indication of the uh, prospects to come, our fourth quarter 2021 GDP growth rate was at 7.7% year on year. And this was again followed by a very strong first quarter this year when growth hit 8.3%. So with this trend, um, global economists are foreseeing the country to be on track to becoming a trillion dollar economy in 10 years time, joining the exclusive company of the largest economies in ATAC. The good thing is that this solid trend translates into a key economic driver that has clearly emerged. And that is the similar bullish prospect of the Philippines internet economy. In the last fiscal year, our, ours grew the fastest in the region as we almost doubled our total gross merchandise value or GMV uh, that rose from 9 billion US dollars to 17 billion US dollars in a year's time. And this double digit growth trend is just expected to continue until 2030, at least based on the findings from the research collaboration that included Google, Bain & Company, and Temasek. So the pandemic really brought out the best out of our internet economy as it spurred stronger digital consumption. Almost everything shifted significantly, as can be seen in the exponential rise across key digital commerce areas, including online ordering and deliveries, um, digital entertainment subscription, and fintech adoption. And this has also driven tech spending across local markets to the point that Forrester actually anticipates the Philippines to lead in this aspect ahead of Vietnam and Malaysia. So the Philippine local demographics is another aspect that is much desired as a prospective market, particularly if you are in the business of delivering cloud, content, and social media interactions. 110 million total population size with almost 90 million active internet and social media users a fairly young population with 25 as the median age, highly digital savvy with high, very high propensity to consume anything digital. The rankings in the slide that you see adequately tells the story. So moving on, if you take a look at the middle chart in this slide, there's actually robust momentum towards cloud growth with Kager expected to be north of 25% going to 2025 and where total cloud opportunity is expected to reach almost 1.3 billion US dollars by then. This is being spurred by a lot of digital transformation initiatives that are being accelerated within the enterprise space, as well as the cloud first policy introduced by the Philippine government in 2020 on the public sector side. So with such um, exciting market potential, we're clearly, we clearly need to make sure that the digital infrastructure readiness will be able to keep pace. And this is where the likes of PLDP come into the picture. So moving on to the next slide, hyperconnectivity going in and out of the country has become a must. And uh, very pleased to share that the Philippines trust to continue to build capacity and resiliency is in full throttle to ensure that we're able to cater to the huge demands that uh, will be coming out of these hyperscalers and cloud providers. Currently, there's about um, 19 subsea systems that already exist, and uh, the PLET group is at the forefront in terms of elevating this further with new investments on both Trans-Pacific and Intra-Asia um, through the new Jupiter Cable System, which we are expecting to go live next month, and the upcoming Asia Direct Cable and Africa Cable Systems, which are programmed to go live in the next two years. Um, we're likewise obviously investing heavily on our ability to host and cater to the localization of cloud nodes and even full availability regions. Jabez already shared the growing data center capacity supply and PLDT through our ICT subsidiary EPLDT is actually leading the charge through our network of 10 data centers which are already in place and with an 11th one forthcoming south of Manila, one that is going to be purpose-built to be the biggest hyperscale grade data center facility 
and that's going to go live by 2023. So just to wrap it up, uh, the Philippines is really keen on making sure that the local business climate is conducive and the relevant programs regionally competitive. Hyperscalers and cloud providers have become a priority investment area as declared by the national government uh, about four quarter of last year. And this actually entitles them to attractive incentives and tax exemptions when they co-locate in our data centers and set up in the country. So in closing, I think the Philippines is really prime for growth. It presents some um, rich market opportunities. It has what it takes to become a digital and hyperscale destination. We're also drawing from our success story 20 years ago when the world took notice of the Philippines as we were able to deliver and became one of the top outsourcing destinations of the world. So the strategic location, digital infrastructure, the rich talent pool, a highly promising market, the sound economic fundamentals, they're all there. So I firmly believe that uh, we will be able to do it again. So that's about it for me. Um, thanks, Jabez, and happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thanks so much, Gary. That was a really insightful, but very concise presentation. And it, it, it's, it's comforting and encouraging to hear that it's not just structural research saying this stuff. Other research firms are also um, validating the, the prospects of the Philippines moving forward. Uh, and so I wanted to get your, your take on this, you know, you're on the ground, I'm, I'm based out of LA. So, you know, I, it's, it's pretty far for me to make it down to the Philippines. You're, you're, you're seeing the development that's happening on a digital infrastructure side, you know, as, as we speak. And so how is the country, in your opinion, uh, gearing up for the incoming global demand in terms of digital infrastructure? Maybe I'd like to start with our very cords of this. So we've been a communication service provider for the last 90 years. So connectivity is at the heart of what we do. As I mentioned earlier, um, all the regional service providers, the communication service providers in the Philippines, they're all excited in terms of putting up huge incremental capacities um, going to the various destinations globally. And a lot of them are expected to go commercially live over the next three years uh, in terms of um, global capacity. So case in point, I've mentioned this a while ago, is our Jupiter cable system, which will be activated by next month. And when that happens, we will be enabling the fastest cable system between the Philippines and the United States. And once that gets fully equipped, uh, from the point of view of PLDT, it will practically triple our existing international network capacity, bringing it to about 60 terabits per second. And um, not only that, it also creates greater international cable network diversity for the country. And uh, those robust routes can actually transport huge amounts of data traffic that can go all the way to the locally based data centers and points of presence that uh, these companies may have. So um, this is but the start of uh, greater capacities that are already programmed in the horizon. I mentioned Asia Direct Cable, I mentioned about Apricot, there are about 20 terabits incremental capacity each coming live in the next two years, and that's only with PLDT. So really, really very uh, bullish in terms of the uh, connectivity aspect, and obviously the, the, on the data center side also, as you have uh, clearly shown in your presentation. Yeah, that's really important that you articulated that data centers are only as good as the connectivity coming into that. And, and I think the international connectivity is really key for the Philippines to take that next step to becoming that hub. And, and apart from other, all of these other massive investments that you've, you've laid out, um, what other assets do you think play a, a key role for hyperscalers to, to choose or select Philippines as their next growth destination? I'd like to stick to my thesis, Jabez. I, I think it will really be the potential market opportunities that is stemming out of a huge connected population with the right market propensity towards digital consumption. And again, we're talking of close to 90 million eyeballs and growing. Um, for the communication service providers and the DC operators, such as the PLDT group, our cloud and hyperscale customers can really leverage on the fact that we own and manage a good part of these eyeballs. And we're also able to aggregate them in our data center through the internet exchange points that we have built in our hosting facilities. So it's really going to be very convenient for them to locate and you know, be able to connect to the rest of the population because it's right there. Yeah, 
and you had a, a slide earlier that was really interesting that articulated the social media use. And I think it was like 90 million people are active on social media in the Philippines, which is pretty crazy to me. Uh, and so building the network and the data center capacity to address that uh, is one thing in terms of digital consumption. Uh, but how is the country uh, or Philippines government or the country itself making uh, digital services accessible to all Filipinos in the country? How, how is that taking shape? So other than ranking at the top uh, across all of the most of the social media platforms, I think it's also in my slide that we're, we also last the longest. I think the average for Filipinos connecting to social media is about 10.5 hours tops. So you can already imagine the kind of expectation that um, we create in terms of experience. I can speak about what we do in PLDT. So uh, at our core, uh, we happen to be the country's um, largest fully integrated telco. And uh, we've been investing a lot. In fact, reinvestment has been um, um, the essence of what we've done over the last um, 10 years. I think we've invested more than 10 billion US dollars. If you take a look at the last 10 years alone in terms of expanding and modernizing the network. And for this year, the, the, the CAPEX guidance is actually another 1.6 billion US dollars. And that actually translates not only to um, massive expansion to cover a wider portion of the population, but also greater user experience uh, that we deliver on both the fixed line and mobile front. So maybe just to cite some, uh, some stats um, from a fiber point of view, I think um, we've deployed more than 800,000 kilometers of fiber already, passing through more than 15 million homes, and that journey continues. So obviously we're also expanding um, significantly on wireless, uh, more than 65,000 wireless base stations already, of which 7,000 are 5G enabled. Although we're practically covering about 97% of the pop Philippine population already. And we just wanna make sure that, you know, this continues to, uh, this service experience continues to improve. Yeah, and I think the fully integrated aspect is really key to delivering that end-to-end -end solution um, to connect the hyperscalers to ultimately to the end users, which is what they want to go after, right? So, um, and you had a, you talked a little bit about government support and, and the proactive nature of the Philippines government in enabling this digital infrastructure growth. Can you share a little bit more details about what's happening in your conversations and in your dealings with, with the government? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one, Zabres. So, Lots of activity in terms of private-public collaboration, and uh, we're very thankful uh, for the past administration in terms of the support that we've been getting in terms of uh, lobbying for the right causes. Um, the government has been very active in pushing the country's digital agenda. Again, there was the cloud-first policy for the national government, which is geared towards enhancing flexibility and security across the various agencies, as well as fortifying the connectivity um, that connects uh, each of the agencies. So there's also the, the AI roadmap, which aims to position the Philippines as a big data processing and analytics hub. And uh, it comes along with the creation of a national center for AI, uh, for AI research that is also being built. But I think the, the, the biggest of them all is really the inclusion of hyperscalers as a priority investment area. So the Philippine Board of Investments, they launched the Make It Happen campaign uh, in, in quarter four of last year, which actually positions the Philippines as an attractive destination for foreign investments. But more importantly, that actually included hyperscalers and cloud companies um, under the CREATE program, that's the Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises Act, which um, actually extend corporate tax rates that are reduced to zero so cool tax holidays for large companies for as long as four years, then 25% for the subsequent uh, years, uh, five years thereof at least. So I think it's very, very exciting. And uh, this is just the start. We want to work closely with, uh, with the incoming administration to do more and to make it even more competitive regionally.
Great, great. Thanks so much, Gary. And, and for the audience, I know you have questions for Gary. So don't worry, Gary will be back uh, after uh, Emil's presentation and we'll do a, a Q&A with Gary and Emil together. So you can ask uh, those questions for Gary. I know I spent a lot of time asking Gary my questions. So don't worry, the audience will have their chance, Gary. Uh, and so thank you so much. Uh, I will we'll bring you back in later. But for now, I wanted to introduce our second uh, PLDT Enterprise uh, executive. His name is Emil Azurin. He's the VP and head for product management for the, the disruptive group. That's a pretty cool name uh, at PLDP Enterprise. So, Anil, welcome. Uh, you know, tell us more about, about what you're doing. Yes, thank you very much, Jabez. So allow me, please, to share my screen. So again, on behalf of uh, EPLDT and PLDT Enterprise, we'd like to thank all of you for spending this morning specifically with us. Uh, first, I'd like to start with this line. We always say that mission critical applications and data necessitate mission-critical infrastructure. Now, to a large extent, this line captures the objectives and the essence of the EPL D3 Vitro Data Center. Our goal really is to be the trusted partner of organizations that are, number one, either starting or accelerating their digital transformation journey, and also the trusted partners of cloud providers who needs to rapidly scale and expand in the Philippines, or in other words, to be the home of your cloud. Now, over the last two decades, we've had nurtured really deep relationship with both enterprises and hyperscalers. We built and gained their trust and have inspired to be part of breakthrough innovations. Again, all of this in the spirit of serving our customers in any which way we can. Um, it all started in the year 2000. Wow, it was 20, 22 years ago. So it all started in the year 2000 when our Pioneer Data Center, the in vitro passing, was launched by EPLDT. And the rest, as they say, is history. So EPLDT today, like what Gary mentioned earlier, is the largest data center operator in the country with a network of 10 purpose-built data centers nationwide. And because we adhere to industry-certified global standards, Vitro has remained to be the preferred primary data center of choice by enterprises and uh, both here and abroad, so that's ranging from e-commerce companies, from multinational organizations and hyperscalers. Now, at this point, allow me to mention just a number of our data centers. So first is Vitro Makati 2. So this is located at the heart of the country's premier business district, that's Makati City in Metro Manila. We fondly call uh, Vitro Makati 2 as the home of hyperscalers or the home of the cloud. So as they chose this location to be one of their strategic sites, We've had, I really can say, intimate detailed design uh, discussions with cloud providers and enterprises to ensure that everything is built and delivered as planned. And in the process, enable them to really rapidly expand and scale moving forward. The good news is that this year, we shall be powering up an additional 6.2 megawatt of IT capacity to serve the ever-growing collocation demands of our customers. Next is Vitro Clark. Uh, which is located in Pampanga, that's roughly 95 kilometers north of Metro Manila. Vitro Clark has evolved to become a strategic disaster recovery site for organizations that are based in Metro Manila. And third is Vitro Cebu, which is located in the province of Cebu, approximately 850 kilometers south of Metro Manila. Now, just a quick um, anecdote here. So just last December, uh, December 2021, Typhoon Odette, known internationally as Rai, made landfall several times on different islands in the Visayas and Mindanao, where it brought torrential rains, violent winds, and storm surges, and has affected over 8 million people across 11 regions. Now, that said, companies who co-located their critical service in Arbitro Data Center Cebu continued to operate. So the facility was 100% operational. its largest hyperscale data center. So Vitro Santa Rosa will be our 11th data center. Okay? Um, it will be the country's largest DC campus by far. It's a five hectare PLDT property in the booming industrial city of Santa Rosa. 
Um, Santa Rosa is geographically ideal, being 100 meters above sea level, far from liquefaction, earthquakes, and other natural disaster risk. And V2 Santa Rosa will be constructed with the highest level of diversity and reliability. So what we'll do is that we'll equip VSR with triple route PLDT domestic fiber. And we will also reach out to telco fiber connectivity from other providers. And to a large extent, I think that would be most ideal for availability zones and point of presence, not just for hyperscalers, but also for critical systems of enterprises. The facility will also have the densest interconnectivity um, to PLDT Group's own internet exchanges, as well as other rich internet ecosystems in the country. This hyperscale facility as well is designed to be, as you can see it, tier three certified and tier four ready. So assuring clients of the highest reliability uptime, as it also includes the construction of an on-site Meralco power Hey, Emil, this is Jabez here. Uh, we sort of lost you on the audio side. Could you uh, check on your uh, connection? Sorry about that, guys. Let us uh, work through the audio issues. Um, sec. Hey, Emil, can you hear me? To mention that PLDT and EPLDT have long-standing relationship with enterprises and hyperscalers, so we do understand deeply the requirements, and that Vito Santa Rosa, uh, the design and operation will be very suited for customers standards. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for, for listening. Thank you for your time. Much appreciated. Thanks, Emil. Uh, we, we lost your audio for a little bit there oh. um, towards the tail end for your, of your presentation. Um, but, yeah. but no worries. Um, you know, I'm sure the, the questions will help to uh, recap yeah. what you just said. But, um, you know, you, you laid out sort of the footprint of PLDT and, and you know, specifically highlighted the sites that you guys are are, are really proud of. Um, but, you know, do you see, given what you're, you've done so far to address, you know, what has PLDT done so far to address this demand that you're seeing? Uh, is there any particular advantage from your perspective from the PLDT side when it comes to data centers? Yes, thanks to Bess. Um, can you hear me well now? I mean, is the audio yeah. okay? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, good, loud good. and clear now. Good, good, okay. So, um, yeah, we, I guess just like what Gary said, we really look forward to the Philippines becoming a major IT destination hub in the region. Um, obviously, not only with will accelerate the digital transformation of organizations nationwide, but to a large extent, it will definitely boost the economy. So in terms of preparation, I think the PLDT group um, is today continuously expanding our capacities in all aspects that we feel are really important to hyperscalers and cloud providers. So one such item would be improving international connectivity. Okay, um, That means really creating more routes to reach the Philippines via international projects such as subsea cables and landing stations. Locally, we're aggressively deploying fiber optic cables across the archipelago and also improving our wireless footprints with 5G via smart. Now, specific to data center, um, the, the mandate really is to really have enough resources, both power and space, to accommodate upcoming demand. 
And with that, what we're doing right now is really expanding the capacities of our existing data centers. So we have our Vitro Makati that's located in, uh, in the greater Metro Manila area. We're also expanding in Vitro Paranaque and at the same time also in a regional area such as Clark and Cebu. And you saw earlier, uh, we just recently did the groundbreaking of Vitro Santa Rosa. That's our 11th data center with massive 36 megawatt of IT power. We're also beefing up our internet exchange, so that's combining both the eyeballs of PLD and smart. And I guess one thing really uh, going for us is that we're fortunate enough to have cloud providers as part of our portfolio already. And through this, we've gained valuable insights and experience about their needs and requirements, and we've incorporated all of these learnings, so to speak, not only in our expansion projects, but also in our future build outs. And I guess I can say that we've been in the data center business for the last 22 years, and we've delivered um, impeccable uptime to our co-location uh, customers. So I guess that's that made us um, today, I would believe, the preferred primary site, not just by local enterprises, but global companies as well in the region. Um, and more importantly, is sustainability. Um, so together we make sure that we give back um, what is due to the environment. So I hope that helps the best. Yeah, no, you touched on a really um, key topic about sustainability, and a lot of people are are interested in. I think there's even a question from the audience on sustainability. Uh, but can you share a little bit about what PLDT sustainability sustainability plans and goals are, especially as it relates to data centers? Definitely, Jabe. So EPLDT shares the same targets with the PLDT group, and that is to reduce carbon footprint by forty percent by 2030 and by 100% by 2050. Um, just to share with the audience, in terms of previous year's performance, we've improved our carbon intensity by 22%, and we're confident to further improve that this year as we use um, renewable energy in six um, out of our 10 data centers already. You saw earlier in the um, renditions, that's Vito Santa Rosa will be, will be installing solar panels throughout the length of the roof. So I believe that this will be enough to power portions of the of the compound, specifically the administration um, office. Now, I guess what's more really important is that we took into consideration sustainability when it comes also to choosing the partners for the upcoming DC. We wanted to make sure that our partners have the same principles as us when it comes to attaining our sustainability goals. And that's where Red Engineering comes in. So Red Engineering, our chosen design consultant, together with their uh, parent company, NG, supports industries in fulfilling the transition of their assets and processes to zero carbon. We also partnered with Maze TPM. Um, they now handle the project management scope and they share the same values. We also have a partnership today with Empower, which is Meralco's local retail electricity supplier to use renewable energy for 20% of supplied electricity to our data centers. Now, um, and to further show our commitment, we acquired ISO 50001 certification for our data centers, which focuses on energy management. And we're also targeting lead certification for our Vito Santa Rosa, to show that we really comply with a stringent framework for healthy, efficient carbon and cost-saving green buildings. So. That's just part of it, the best. Great, no, that's uh, that's really insightful. Thanks for sharing. And and last question for me before we do a, a general Q and A and let the audience have a chance to ask the questions to you guys. Perhaps um, you know there. You know, in my initial slide, I, I sort of list of all the DC operators that are looking to develop and build out you know hyperscale sites in the Philippines market. Um, I know you you talked a little bit about you know, Vitor Santa Rosa earlier about the size, the sustainability aspects of it, but how, how are you going to differentiate that site or that campus um, from these other regional and global players that are coming into the Philippines market? Yeah, thank you, Jabez. Um, I, I would say the primary differentiator really is that we're able to provide an end-to-end -end experience for our customers. So that's ranging from connectivity, the data center facility itself, and the internet exchange capacity. So sort of a one-stop shop, so to speak. So we can definitely make it easier for our customers to establish and manage their projects and or deployments here in the Philippines. 
Um, we also want to highlight that we're telco neutral and we encourage other telcos to provision ahead of time in Vito Santa Rosa. Now, specific to PLDT connectivity, uh, we will make sure that there are three fiber routes for redundancy and that we have direct connections to upcoming projects such as the Diet cable landing stations and the Jupiter subsea cables. Now, to further differentiate Vito Santa Rosa, uh, I should say that this will be the first data center in the country with a dedicated substation within its compound. So this is in partnership with, Met with uh, Meralco. So that said, customers are assured of a power supply redundancy. Um, and ultimately, I guess um, it all boils down to the experience. Um, we've been like what we mentioned earlier. Uh, we've been here for the last 22 years. And we see that Vito Santa Rosa is a culmination of a two decades of experience in this data center business. So, yes, uh, that's the short answer to that. Great, thanks, Emil. And, and yeah, you. appreciate the insights. Let's bring back Gary as well into the conversation and, and go through some of the questions that the audience have posted for us. Um, I know Rizal has been help, helping us to um, sort of Co collate these questions and there's there's a question coming from Arlon um, maybe Gary and Emil you guys might be able to tag team on this but can you share some insights on data center construction here in the Philippines you know what are some of the advantages and challenges um, hyperscalers and even potential data center operators face in building facilities here in the in the Philippines yeah you want to take that on Gary Um, sorry, I sorry. Can you just say that again, yeah. Zach? One more, one sure, more. sure. No worries. Um, so from Arlon, he, he was asking, you know, can you share some insights on data center construction or, or just how what it takes to build a data center here in the Philippines? Um, you know, given your experience building data centers throughout throughout just not just Manila but other parts of the Philippines as well, what are the advantages and challenges um, that hyperscalers and even you know, up, upcoming data center operators face in building facility uh, data center sites here in the Philippines. If I may, Gary, if I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I hope you don't mind. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I guess the best if we just go through the process that will take uh, maybe two or three hours. <laughs> <laughs> but um, often if I may just summarize them into several or just some quick key points. One is really the location, um, I guess. Uh, uh, we the company took into consideration number one the access to redundant power number two is like what you said earlier but gary emphasized as well there has to be redundancy in terms of connectivity fiber connectivity um, number three in terms of um, uh, environmental risks it has to be in a safe place, so to speak. So there's a lot of process that goes along with it, some evaluation processes, some risk management and risk assessment as well. And ultimately, I guess, um, also in terms of sustainability, um, how can we uh, make sure that what uh, that the impact to the environment, uh, specifically of that campus or that infrastructure, would be mitigated at least very uh, at least minimized. Okay. Another thing to consider is its proximity with existing data centers. Obviously, there's that um, uh, uh, point about making it really redundant, making it really um, sort of a different uh, or a separate availability zone or point of presence, so to speak. Yeah. Gary, you may want to add. Yeah, all good, Emil. Okay. I think you've covered it adequately. I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah, it does. And and before we move on to further questions, um, you know, a, a common question for most of these webinars is, you know, can we can the audience get the slide deck and will this be viewable, viewable on demand? And so I'm hearing from the PLD team that yes, uh, we'll share the slide deck with those registered, and then there'll also be an on on demand viewing um, later on when when we're able to upload the video. So please be patient, please bear with us. Um, but moving on to another question, I think Gary, maybe this is a more of a question for you. Um, could you share about the more about the domestic fiber connectivity situation in South of Manila, where a lot of the sites are coming online, especially your hyperscale campus? And is there sort of an expansion plan for domestic fiber in that part of town? We've always been on expansion mode when it comes to fiber. Uh, been very aggressive at it. 
um, it precedes the pandemic. Though the pandemic, it was really the height because we were deploying a lot. Um, anyway, specific to the question, south of Manila is always something that is um, very special um, for the PLET group as a market. It's a booming area. It's a heavily industrialized area and uh, a lot of suburbs also. Um, so a lot of homes rising up, a lot of villages and subdivisions. So very strong programs specific uh, to that area. Uh, Amil mentioned, and we all mentioned that we're setting up a data center there. So naturally, we really have to fortify what we already have there. So maybe just to give you a flavor, um, for the year, we're actually programmed to revision um, close to 2 million additional ports. Um, and we're expecting a good part of that, a considerable part of that is going to end up within the area because you know um, the demand is just uh, very signif significant uh, right there. Got it. Emil, anything to add on that or? I think Gary covered it. Okay, yeah, and maybe it. one for one, maybe one for you too, Emil. Um, in terms of sustainability that you kind of laid out earlier, um, is PLDT looking at the likes of Leeds, GHG, ISO fourteen thousand, or GRESP? Um, what can you share about about that? Uh, definitely, Jabez. Um, sustainability is a is a core pillar within the organization, and we really took that to heart. Um, when we design our in, in the process of designing our Vito Santa Rosa data center, and it goes beyond just the design, but also in the um, operations and moving forward in all aspects of, 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 of Vito Santa Rosa. In fact, um, like what we mentioned earlier, um, we're really targeting lead, cert lead certification for Vito Santa Rosa. Uh, today, we acquired ISO 50001 certification for our data centers. Um, we we deliberately partnered with global entities who share the same sustainability sustainability uh, visions um, with that of us. So that's Red Engineering and with their parent company NG. We all know that. Um, again, renewable energy is a must for Vitor Santa Rosa. That's why we're also partnering uh, with Empower to ensure that at least 20% of supplied energy to Santa Rosa would be coming from renewable energy sources. Um, we likewise mentioned earlier, like um, uh, really watching our uh, water utility efficiency, our carbon um, efficiency, um, wastewater reuse, and all of those um, very important items as well. So ultimately, um, if I'm not mistaken, we talked about um, the targets of uh, PLDT, which is to reduce the carbon footprint by 40% by the year 2030 and by 100% by 2050. And that means really starting today. So hope that helps the best. Yeah, it does. Thanks, thanks, Emil. Uh, I think maybe two more questions and then we'll we'll wrap up um, given the, the time. I wanna be respectful of people's time that, that took to attend this webinar. And so Gary, maybe for you first, can you, uh, you know, we, we talked about how, you know, the Philippines is attractive, but also other, Tier one markets, uh, tier two markets across ASEAN are also ramping up their uh, pursuit of digital infrastructure investments and deployments in the region. Um, and so, in your view, sort of how does Philippines, you know, kind of compare, and how do they, how does it unique or stand out uh, compared to these other uh, markets? Thank you, Jabez. Again, I would like to stick to my thesis. Um, infrastructure. I think everybody is going to reach a certain point where. We are all prepared. We will we will all be able to accommodate. But the thing that will be left unmatched is the unique ability of the Philippines in terms of presenting a um, potentially lucrative opportunity um, for companies who would like to cloud companies and hyperscalers of that who would like to set up uh, their shop in the Philippines. Um, you mentioned that in your presentation, uh, growth wise, uh, we're clocking at number two, uh, and we have. Um, that market, um, that huge consumer market, um, who is very uh, digital savvy, and again, who who has the tendency to really consume all things digital, and the trends are showing that. So that alone, um, maybe together with um, the prospects of growth within the enterprise space, again, everybody shifting towards digital, public sector is enforcing 
the cloud first policy that's just all going to come out and present um, massive opportunities for whichever provider who wishes to tap into that kind of a market got it got it thanks gary and Emil, um, you know, Gary touched a little bit on government incentives and being proactive for digital infrastructure growth and specifically around, you know, the cloud first policy. Um, how, how is, you know, TLDT built to support that uh, from a data center standpoint in your, in your view? Yeah, thank you, Jabez. Um, I understand that as guidance last year, DICT released the amended cloud first policy which aims to, I guess, provide a clearer overview of what the guidelines, uh, for example, that includes um, looking at the type of data and the corresponding cloud infrastructure that can host them. So if I recall correctly, uh, the guideline states that data can be classified into several items like non-sensitive, sensitive, above sensitive, and highly sensitive. And they likewise uh, mentioned the corresponding and appropriate platforms such as public cloud, um, public cloud in country, and for above sensitive and private, uh, and for uh, really highly sensitive data, they're recommending a private cloud that are in country. Okay, um, so I guess the good news is that EPLDD can be of service in this scenario. We can then at least scope, align, and assess the current ICT infrastructure. And that includes categorizing the data uh, that you have. Uh, next is really to prioritize which data should be migrate um, to the corresponding cloud info. And ultimately, there you go, migrate and implement based on the roadmap. So um, EPLDT, the good is that EPLDT can enable a full hybrid cloud environment, which is comprised of a public, a private, or a combination of both. So that to a large extent is how we really will uh, support the cloud first policy of the government. So thank you. <clears throat> Great, thanks Emil. Uh, and with that, yes, uh, we'll wrap up and appreciate everyone taking the time to attend and ask the questions and engage with myself and Gary and Emil. Uh, I know there's more questions on there that we couldn't address given the time limit, um, but but if not, you can, you can always find PLDT, you can go to the PLDT enterprise.com website uh, or reach out to Gary and Emil via LinkedIn. They're, they're, they're on there as well if you want to uh, ask them specific questions. Uh, and then for myself, you know, uh, feel free to hop, hop on the Structure Research website, structureresearch.io. If you have uh, more questions or you're curious on what other types of reports that we publish um, outside of the Manila report that was highlighted here, uh, and then myself, JT at structureresearch.io. If you have any comments or feedback or questions, happy to happy to answer that. But thank you again, Gary and Emil. Appreciate your time and appreciate you guys partnering with us to help to highlight and put Philippines front and center for a lot of the cloud providers, enterprises, and users, as well as the operators that are interested in, in exploring this market. So thank you guys for uh, sharing all your insights. Appreciate it. Thank you, Javis. Thank Thanks. you. All right, take Stay care, safe. everyone. Stay safe, everyone.